Welcome to uh, MIT InnoTherm. Uh, this is uh, our fourth colloquium, and uh, this is uh, uh, launched uh, uh, actually four weeks ago. So we have been doing this by we uh, weekly, but also uh, based on the survey we did, we're going to change into bi-weekly. So the next one will be two weeks uh, uh, later. And uh, I want to show the last time we did a survey on the topics uh, people would like to hear, interested on, uh, in. And you can see they're uh, very strong interest in new materials and uh, with engineered uh, properties, thermal properties. Uh, lots of interest in whiskey and phase change, heat pumps. But overall, this is a range of topics. Um, there are uh, quite considerable interest uh, on all of them. So we are going to reach out to community and uh, find some of the uh, people really uh, expert in this area. Uh, we're going to organize uh, uh, the uh, future colloquia first around these topics, and then we'll do more survey, and we are always open for input on future topics and uh, suggestions uh, for also speakers and topic as well as topics. And today, uh, as we were just chatting, you already see we have a very international uh, panel. Uh, the talk will be given by Professor Zhang Yi from Tsinghua University on um, HVAC. And they, there will be very interesting debate on whether this is centralized or it's better to be centralized or decentralized that I'm sure uh, we can learn a lot uh, from uh, today's discussion. And today's uh, event will be moderated by uh, Yang Yin Zhu, uh, Professor Yang Yin Zhu, and uh, I will briefly introduce her and then turn over to her to introduce a speaker and the panelist. But let me remind the next event will be two weeks later, also same time, June 3rd, the talk will be uh, by King Gusen on electronic cooling. And then we also have topic two weeks later on battery thermal management and safety. And with that, uh, this is a, a slide introducing uh, Yang Yin Zhu. And she is currently a system professor at the UC San Barbara. She got her uh, PhD from MIT. And uh, she also very interesting got uh, her bachelor degree from Tsinghua University from the same department as uh, our speaker today, uh, Professor uh, Zhang Yi. Her research is in heat and mass transfer, phase change, energy conversion and storage, thermal management of electronics, personal thermal management, micro nanotechnology, and thermal characterization. With that, I will turn to Yang Yin, and Yang Yin, you can take over from here. You can share your screen. Thank you, Gang. Thank you. Uh, it's been a great honor uh, for me to host this uh, today's uh, symposium, and um, I will uh, share my screen with you. So uh, it's my great honor not only uh, to be part of this symposium, but to be really introducing our guest speaker today, uh, Professor uh, Jiang Yi. Um, he is currently a professor at the School of Architecture. So Yang Yi, you may want to use a full panel. Yes, so mm -hmm. I will try to uh, share my whole screen. Yeah. So uh, Professor uh, Jiang Yi, uh, he's currently a professor in the School of Architecture uh, in Tsinghua University in China. He is uh, the um, Director of Building Energy Research Center in Tsinghua University. So formally, he is the department uh, in the faculty of Department of uh, Thermal Engineering, Engin uh, Thermal Energy Engineering in Tsinghua University. So you will see in his talk that he uh, has lots of experience in building energy efficiency, uh, building thermal process simulation and building automation, uh, which is a class that I took in my undergrad. And um, he also uh, has a lot of experience in building energy study and policy design. So he is a uh, member of the Ch Chinese Academy of Engineering 
and uh, uh, a, a member of the China, China's Climate Change Advisory Committee. So uh, we also introduce uh, today's uh, panel uh, panelist. So we have we're honored to have uh, three uh, members on our panel. So first, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ravi Prasher. Um, so uh, Professor Ravi Prasher, he is currently the Associate Lab Director of the Energy Technology Area in the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So he's also an adjunct professor at the uh, UC Berkeley in the mechanical engineering. Uh, previously, he uh, has uh, he was the vice president of uh, both in industry as well as uh, SheTech as well as in uh, uh, ARPA E as a program manager. Uh, you can see that he has uh, managed uh, programs related to building energy efficiency and a high energy advanced thermal storage program. Um, uh, in addition, he's also uh, was a te technology development manager at Intel. And his research area is very broad, uh, ranging from nanostructured materials to uh, thermal devices. Um, and uh, our, our next panelist, uh, we have uh, Professor Alexis Abramson. Uh, she is the Dean and Professor of Engineering in uh, Dartmouth College. Formerly, she is a Professor of Energy Innovation at uh, Case Western Reverse University. Uh, she, she is a chief scientist, uh, manager, manager of en energy emerging technologies divisions in the uh, US Department of Energy's building technology program. And uh, she's also uh, advi uh, was a advi uh, technical advisor for Breakthrough Energy Ventures. You can also see that her uh, research, her uh, broad research interests are ranging from building energy efficiency, uh, nanoscale energy transport, uh, thermal electrical and thermal uh, electronic properties of nanostructures, composite materials, biomaterials, uh, interfacial thermal resistance, and uh, computational uh, uh, modeling of heat mass transfer. Uh, our last panelist is uh, Dr. Satish Kumar. He is currently a president and uh, the executive director of uh, the Alliance for an Energy Efficient Economy in India. And uh, he's has, he was formerly the vice president and uh, energy uh, efficiency ambassador at energy management at the Schneider Elect uh, Electric India uh, industry. So he's uh, also formerly, uh, he worked at uh, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And so with that, I would like to uh, uh, briefly uh, introduce today's agenda. Uh, so we, we will have um, uh, Professor Jiang Yi to share with us um, uh, his talk on discussing building uh, heating and cooling ventilation systems. Um, and uh, his presentation will last for about 30 minutes. We will have two pop quizzes for the audience because the goal of this uh, seminar is really to get uh, get feedback and promote discussion, promote communication with our community. And at the end of uh, Professor Jiang Yi's talk, we will engage panel discussion. And uh, well, you are welcome to submit your questions for the panelists through the Q and A button in the Zoom. So if you look uh, at the bottom of the Zoom, you will see this Q and A function. So this is where you can type in your questions throughout any time throughout uh, our uh, seminar. Uh, so and uh, and just I uh, would like to remind everybody that we may receive lots of questions and we may not be able to answer all of them, but we will uh, choose questions based on popularity. And uh, you are welcome to indicate your name and your affiliation. Uh, so by default, we will be reading out your name. We'll be announcing your name and affiliation. Um, if you prefer to stay anonymous, uh, please state so uh, in when you're submitting your question. And so uh, I would like to <laughs> quickly remind you that uh, this, uh, this symposium, this colloquium is being recorded. 
uh, as of now um, uh, and still will be recorded. Um, the reason is that we would like to post process them and post them onto uh, the YouTube so that we could more audience could have access to the today's talk. Uh, we will uh, uh, try to address additional questions that the panelists uh, cannot address today. And uh, we will try to include them uh, into the recording. Uh, last, uh, just to briefly emphasize that, uh, if you prefer to stay anonymous, please state so in your questions. So with that, I would like to, uh, you know, I would like to first, uh, before we introduce our speaker, I would like to uh, launch two quizzes for you. And so, because today our topic is going to be on building energies. So let me uh, try to stop share. We will uh, try to focus on building energies. So we thought that it will maybe be interesting for us to uh, get some feedback uh, on our general uh, 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 you know, perception of building energies. So I will, if you, uh, I will launch the first uh, poll question. So I think that in your screen, you uh, may see the number one kind of a quiz question. So the question is, uh, which of the below should be prioritized when we operate an air conditioning system? Right, so the first is that we should be maximizing the efficiency of the equipment, including the chillers or the fans, etc. Um, the second is that we should be focusing on reducing the total energy consumption, uh, even though the equipment may not be operating at their maximum efficiency. And the third is that they're equal. So maximum efficiency means low energy consumption. And I think that we, uh, uh, so I think that we have, uh, you know, increasing number of uh, people answering the polls. So I'll leave it open for another second, for another few seconds uh, before we end the poll. Um, so again, the, the question is, uh, when we're designing building uh, air conditioning systems, which should we prioritize? Should we prioritize maximum efficiency of the hardwares or should we prioritize over reducing the total energy consumption? So I think that we, I would like to end the poll here uh, and show the result. So you can see that most uh, of us uh, thinks that you reducing the total energy consumption is more important. And you will see uh, through uh, Professor Jiang Yi's talk is that uh, this is indeed, uh, this should be prioritized over in, you know, in focusing on individual efficiencies of the equipment. So the second quiz will be that, you know, I think that I have just launched the second poll, second quiz. This question asks how much energy saving can be achieved in an intelligent building, uh, which is one that with um, analytics and advanced controls. So how much energy savings in terms of percentage uh, can be achieved if we have uh, intelligent building? Uh, just, uh, you know, guess a number. <laughs> So I think that, you know, people, as people are entering the, uh, the, the answers, um, uh, we like to, uh, we like to mention that, you know, an intelligent building and, uh, in the future, maybe an interesting future direction, uh, also buildings with, you know, artificial intelligence. So hopefully this, you, you can also, uh, see this, uh, through Professor Jiang Yi's talk. So now I think that uh, we have uh, got a lot of uh, response. So you can see that a lot of people guessed uh, between 30 and 40%. And uh, this is, you know, this is also very 
uh, very great, great answer. <laughs> so now I would like to stop, uh, you know, share the result. Uh, and um, uh, I would like to, uh, you know, we finished the two quizzes and uh, hopefully uh, you find, uh, you know, uh, building energy, it's really related to our daily life. And I would like to now, uh, you know, give the stage to Professor Jiang Yi. And he will, uh, let me, sorry, he will share his screen and uh, start his presentation. So Professor uh, Jiang Yi, if you could share your screen with us, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Oh, so then can you switch off this? Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you, Yang Yang Chen, for your introduction. Thank you, Professor Gang Chen, who invited me to give the, this talk. And uh, good morning, good evening, good everyone. And uh, the topic uh, I, I'm going to talk today is uh, something like a centralized or decentralized of the building service system, especially HMAS system. And because the building energy is really something important. Mm? Okay. And uh, by the years of 2018, the total <coughs> the building energy use in the world is take almost 30% of the total energy of the world. And the Carbon emission is also as much as 28%. And uh, here is still big difference between the developed countries and the emerging countries. If you see the left corner, here show you the building energy use in terms of the <coughs> per height. This is the horizontal word. And the vertical is in terms of the per square meters of the building floor. You can see there are really big difference, big difference. And on the right side is show you the CO two emission in terms of per height. Also, different countries are seems quite different. Where the red was the building responsible for the CO2 emission. Why is there so huge difference? One of the reasons is a different type of the HMAX system. So then we go to today's topic, the centralized system or decentralized. Which one in terms of the energy use? Well, what's different? And the meaning I said centralized system just like this. You have, for instance, you have the, 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 the central chiller here, then you have the water, chilled water diffusion to deliver the chilled water to each air handler unit, where you make cold air to go to everywhere, to go to the VV box, and then they deliver the cold air to the each space. It's a central air conditioning system. For the decentralized means every room, maybe you have your own split unit, you have indoor unit and outdoor unit, and they can do independently. And now let's see some real data. Here is the measured data. We take this ABC three residential buildings in Beijing, and each room, every room in this three building do have air conditioning for the summer for cooling, but the Electricity used in terms of per square meters all of the summer, you can see it's relatively low, only two or three kilowatt hours per square meters. Then you come to building D, it's something like a small scale of central air conditioning. They use so called VRF, multi indoor unit connected with one outdoor unit. The energy use the little bit higher is five kilowatt hour per square meters annually. 
But then you come to the building E is a big also for residential thin apartment. They have central air conditioning system for air 24 hours served. And the electricity used is almost 20 degree, 20 kilowatt hour. It's almost 10 times as this A, B, and C. Why? What the difference is, in fact, it's quite simple because the building E is a central air conditioning system. They provide service for 24 hours a day and for every space. But the ABC like this is decentralized. Every room they have one, and then people, when they empty the room, they switch off. That's only the difference. And then you can see here is one of the building, 25 families here. Then they gave the data for cooling, also in terms of per square meters, kilowatt hour. You can see huge difference. Means every family, also the building is the same, but every family is uh, they, 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 more, they run the air conditioning in a very, very different way. Then if you do the central system, you need all this energy. Then you can know where the difference come from. Okay. Now let's go to the then we say that's the, the low energy due to the part-time part space service rather than full time and full space service. And we did a very large scale monitor on 200 souls and VRF system like this. One outdoor unit then can make connected with five or six indoor unit for how far me is in fact this kind of central small scale central air conditioning is very modern in China here. And then we got the how years data, minutes by minutes, lot of few T data, huge. And then what we discovered, we found almost 60% of the operation time, the indoor unit, only one indoor unit turn on. Then another 27% of the time, they run two indoor unit. Also, the system make five or six indoor unit connected, but they only run one or two. That's how they switch up. Then if you see the load, more than 40% of the time, they work, the whole system working under 20% of the load, and more than 70% of the operation time, the total load is less than 40%. It means they always working at the part, part load. Only very few, very few, almost very few times they can work in full load. They say really what the people like in the residential buildings. Then we make some large scale of the view to see different situation, how much the electricity used for cooling and for the all use speed unit, you can see whatever they are Canton near Hong Kong, very hot place. Here is Beijing or different cities. Also, Wuhan should be here. Okay. Whatever the climate, the electricity use for cooling, if you still take a per square meters of the floor, it's just around five kilowatt hour for years. But if you use functional unit here, these three means you have central chilled water circulated and each space they have individual functional unit can turn on or turn off. Then the electricity used come to around 10 kilowatt hour or more. Then if you go to the really fully centralized system, like with radiation cooling on the ceiling, then the electricity also can be as high as 20 or more. So you see huge difference between the centralized, some centralized, half centralized, or independent decentralized system. Then we come to the large office building like this, downside you can see, and this case, 
，再还有土满里土台巴夫，阿个你是明白是放好有用的，也是这阿亚西泰姆也是 independent space by space， 把它 water 西泰姆也是 connected 的，比一个气拉 water 西泰姆，那这台不也是微微西泰姆，也是 fully aired centralized 的西泰姆，又跟谁因背景分担是放好有用的。Around 15 kilowatt hour per square meter, is annually, but the VAV system fully centralized is more than 30 kilowatt hour. It's, it's quite a big difference. Then come to Shanghai, the same central unit, similar, but then the VAV system you can say are uh, much higher. Why? Then we come to the US. I also got a lot of data. From some city in US, here is the data in Philadelphia, a uh, university campus in Philadelphia. You can see the office building A, B, C, D, use VV system for IR, 24 hours operation. The annual energy is electricity used is almost, you see, 200 kilowatt hour. But very lucky in the same campus. There is a building with the same function, office building, but installed with functional unit. You can see the total electricity use for cooling just around 30 kilowatt hour. It's huge difference. So same feature compared with China, similar feature. Then we come to Japan, they have the large district cooling system, not a similar building, but a number of buildings. Here is the Japanese District Cooling and Heating Association gave the data. They have hundred, more than 100 projects. Each one is one node here. And the base one, the Japanese belief, is Harumi one is here. The COP is something 1.2, where they count the COP by the output of the cooling divided by the primary energy, but in US and in China, we use the to use electricity. Then you have to, according to Japanese situation, you have to multiply that data by 2.6. Then you got 3.13, 3.13, that's the maximum one, the highest one of the COP. But what happened in US or in China, if you take a single building, big chiller on the ground, you measure the COP. Normally, it's three or four. Even I find some building 4.5, that's very normal. But for district cooling, the COP you can see from this curve, highest 3.3, a lot of things below three. That means the different cooling is not an advantage compared with individual chilled system for each building. OK, why? All this data from the residential building to large scale of the district cooling, always something, it seems to me, for the centralized, is more energy needed. And for decentralized, less energy. Why? What reason? The people who support the centralized system, they believe they are the larger system, they are higher efficiency, and maybe by coincidence, they can less capacity needed, and then better operation, better management, even safe space. But for the people who support the decentralized system, they believe for the small one, independent one, they are easy to adjust it, and flexible, for response and also no energy need for distribution. That's also an advantage. Then for the part load situation, maybe they can got high efficiency. So two different points. Then where the central system idea come from? I believe they are come from industry. Because for industry, when you produce things, the larger the amount, the high efficiency you can got. However, there are something different. For industry process, the target is to produce things. But for building service, 
the target is to provide the service to the customer, to each occupant, occupant. and they produce the, for the industry, the product is always the same, the large amount of things exactly the same they multiply to produce, but for the building service also is for each occupant. But the people by by one by another, they always have different demand, different situation. So then because of the difference, that's the big difference, the demand is different combined with the, the industry process, same amount of large scale of the production. So then you can find maybe because this reason. The centralized large amount of things may be not efficiency, maybe use more energy. So then the problem come from the different on the demand. If central system, then we maybe think how to describe this different demand phenomena or the characters. So then we have to find some feature. What the the demand uh, feature. First, when you need to do something, need demand, okay, demand, then the system have to supply something. What is the relationship for building service situation as soon as the supply larger than a demand in a certain range, then the people is satisfied. Means they are not asking you to equal make the supply equal to the demand. But then for central system, because the demand is different one by another, then in many, many cases, the supply just meet the one who have the maximum demand. Then the rest of the terminal, the rest of the people, they say, okay, I'm also satisfied. But in fact, they are over supply. That's one case. Then you see the system, the building you need something, then the air system provide more, then the water system provide to the air, also add some more things, then the chiller add more. So by the end, the supply is quite higher than the real demand. So then we see another feature is the unsecure occupancy time, means if they have, you have a centralized system sir, provide the service to a large number of the space, then you can find each space, the, 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 the time that they need to have the service are really something different. One space by another. Here is something in different city we did measurement on the residual buildings for each space, when the people occupy and when the people live in, they are very different on the time. So then, however, for central system, they have to run the service for all the space to meet the demand. Even if there's some empty room, they still provide service, also makes the oversupply. Then we see the quantity of the variation also is uncentral. But normally we're talking about heating and cooling. In fact, heating is something different from cooling. When you do the heating, the major influence factor for the load is the climate, is the temperature difference between indoor and outdoor. That's the major influence factors. Because we are all the building under single one umbrella. So then the temperature difference between indoor and outdoor is simultaneous variation. So then it's not so many problems. However, when you're talking about the cooling, the things are getting completely different because the indoor temperature and outdoor, the difference is relatively small. And the major influence is the indoor heat gain like a solar number of people, lighting equipment, all these kind of things that make the load change greatly during the day and they are changed according to the real usage of each space. Then because each space being used in a very different way, 
then the need for the cooling are very different like this. For different rooms, you can say really something different. So different time, different uh, quantity, quantity. Then we see the quality also unsafe. Here is the wind tanks for the baby system because you need the outdoor air to maintain your indoor air quality. So according to the number of the people inside, Maybe one room you need 50% of the outdoor air, another room you need 30%, then another room you need 90%. Then for a VV system, they can only deliver single kind of air to each room. Then they have to choose the maximum 90%. So they have to take 90% of the air is out from outdoor, make high energy use. Or another word, all supply for quality. Here is another is the chilled water. We take that not only for temperature control, but also for humidity control. But normally, if you take a sen <coughs> sense heat, you need as soon as the water temperature come to 16 degrees C is good enough. However, if you do the defumidification, you need 7 degrees C chilled water. So also the dehumidification maybe only take 30% of the total cooling load. But you have to make all the cooling load provided under 70, 7 degrees C chilled water. You know, 7 degrees C water is much expensive compared with 16. You over supply the quality of the service. So whatever time, the quantity, quantity, everything, because the centralized, you have to always find the maximum demand, maximum requirement, you make this meet, you meet this demand, and then you all supply to the rest, like this, <coughs> banquet, like this banquet, okay. Now, then if you find really the unsensual demand characters is something change, something influence the centralized system, then when we're going to study that, we do need a way to describe these characters, how unsensual of the demand. Then we can find, if you take this horizontal, is the <coughs> Uh, cumulated of the share of the demand, and then the vertical is the dimensionalized of the demand. You can find the, the, the requirement or demand distribution like this curve. Then, that's the Lawrence curve. Then you can take this IR divided by the triangle, you make the Gini index, okay. This Gini index. That can describe how different the demand is, how uncentralized change the variated of the demand. So, for instance, for heating, if you in Harbin in China, the outdoor temperature is minus 26, then in this case situation, the demand is very uniform for the distribution. Then the genius index is 0 0.3. If you come to Beijing, minus 9, the genius index is 0 0.5. It's not still not too bad. But if you come to Shanghai, the outdoor temperature is 10 degrees C. You can find the distribution is really something ununiformed. So then the genius index is very high, 0 0.8. So they can show you how big difference, how uh, unsaturated of the load or the demand. And here is for large CBD air. If there's 80 office buildings, but not 10 hotel buildings with two bars, you can find the each type of building, the, the feature the, during the day is something different. And then in the middle of day, in the noon time, 11 o'clock, the genius number is quite small because it's every building don't need cooling. But during the night, this very un, 
uniform the uh, distribution, the genus and number come to 0 0.9, maybe only two bomb operation and all the rest, they switch off. So this can be described that as the parameters to say how the variation, how not a simultaneous change. Then we, we said we can study these three questions. First, what the really the people like need? And here we take uh, okay more than 2,000 situation collected through our monitor system. We find the set point temperature. Normally people say, okay, man, I need 22 degrees Celsius, 24. And in the same time, in the summer, what happened? The set point that the people need is from 16 degrees C to 30 degrees C in a very, very large range, very large range of the distribution. This comes from 2008. Then we got another three cities, Chongqing, Wuhan, Shanghai, all each city take more than 500 data, you see also in the summer, large range of the distribution, in the winter also quite different. Means there's not certainly right, small range of the demand. Everyone think, oh, what the set, type, set point of temperature? Even some people, they don't understand what means the set point. Uh, then if there are central system, survey system, some people need 26 degrees C, some people need 20, and there's one people need 16 degrees C, very low temperature. What happened? The system has to try to meet this demand of 16 degrees C and to make this supply of temperature, and then the rest of the room, rest of the space will be have to make some adjustment or in trouble. That's the demand. Then in this situation, can the system meet the demand? You say we're talking about a different time. What happened if the every space need be served at a different time? Then the central system has to operate it. Even if there's only single space need to provide service, they still have to turn on the whole system. Then for VV system, for instance, because there's only one hundred rooms to serve with 20 or 30 rooms, then they have to run that, even only one room is occupied. Then you have the central chilled, chilled water system, even very small portion of the load or terminal that, that they need chill the water, you have to run the whole network. Then you see the outdoor IR system, Normally, whatever in US or in China or in the world, for the outdoor air system, for central air conditioning system, they always full load operation, regardless how many people inside been, been taking this service. Then the result is what happened. Because normally the overtime rate of the buildings is as small as 20 to 40%. Then the central system just provide the service for the empty room for in most of the time, in the most of the time. But for the decentralized system, they can provide the service just to the space that is occupied and switch off the others. That's much different. Then when the, the need for cooling or heating the amount is different, what happened? For VV system, they can change the volume to each space. They say, okay, I can do the adjustment. However, for small range, yes, you could, but for the large range, they can hardly do the adjust, meet the, all the demand. Especially when each everyone have different temperature set point, then this be very hard to make uh, to meet each demand only by variation of the air volume. Then what happened? They have to use reheat. What means reheat? You see this curve. The outdoor air temperature, this, and the return water, uh, return air temperature, 22, then mix it into 21, 
then they be called down to 14, and then before they are delivered to the room, they been right hit at the terminal back to about 20, 21 degrees. So you, you use more than 200 kilowatt cooling, then you use 220 kilowatt heating. In the total, in fact, you only need 30 something kilowatt for cooling that's good enough. However, in fact, they consume 500 kilowatt. This is the real data I measured, I got from one of the operation project in US, the real things. And here I show you four buildings also this annual data. Here is four different buildings located in Philadelphia. And horizontal is the outdoor temperature, you can see in the summer, 94 Hansai, in the winter, 44 Hansai. And the vertical is the BTO, how much heating and how much cooling they use under one temperature, for instance, outdoor temperature 70, then you sometimes different time you need this heating and you need this cooling. Then you can find whatever outdoor how hot in the summer, they still need heating. You see, need heating very hot. Need heating in outdoor is 90 from say. Then in the winter, very cold, they still need cooling, you can see. So at least 30% of the heating and the cooling just be outside against each other be lost, not being really used to the building. That's also one of the reasons is essentialized system to do that. And then with the genius index, we just mentioned the more the ununiformed, the more high rate of the reheat. But if you if you cannot change the volume, then 55, okay, then be more reheat you need. You can you can find if they are very uniform, the small genius index means all the space are simultaneously changed, then will be no need for reheat. That's the situation. So then we see the transportation system, how they make the adjustment on the water, on the air to meet the each demand first. For for instance, we can say like the domestic hot water system because people need hot, hot water different time. But to make sure they, when they turn on, it's really got hot water, they have to make the hot water circulated 24 hours all the time. Even this less 10% of terminal need water, they still need to do the circulation. Then we find maybe half of the heat not being used for the terminal, but just be lost during the circulation. It's hot water. Then the VV system I just mentioned, the change the volume cannot come. The volume cannot be completely switched off for the unoccupied room. So they also provide some service. Then the functional unit they need chiller chilled water circulation. Even there's only one percent of the people or the terminal needs the water, they have to make the whole water circulated all the time, and then outdoor air yeah, also the problem. So through the adjustment, it's hard to solve this distribution network, so make the oversupply is the result. Then we see, during the control in the network, if every air handler unit needs different water flow rate, then you have to use the valve to control what the function of the what valve just to consume the pump's energy, the dirty P, the dirty P, who provided this dirty P is the pump. So, and then you can find the more the ununiformed, the larger gene index, then the more, more energy being used consumed by the pump, by the valves, that's lost of the pump's energy. Not only the pump's energy, also 
because they are okay here there are some uh, uh, different water temperature from the each 100 unit because the load is different then they have the water mixing different temperature and make large amount of entrance dissipation here and also if you even make three valves here is some mixture temperature different temperature with water mixture together also take a lot of entrance loss all related with Gini syntax here is the equivalent temperature difference of entrance loss so means also yes the transportation system can make the judgment in most of the case but it's just to try to consume the additional part rather than save something they just try to consume the more part to make the measure to make the control then i show you a very strange case study happened in china there's a project in henan it's a water water heat pump system to provide cheap water for cooling of all this this residential buildings there's about 500 unit of frontal unit connected with this system and the measurement we find in terms of per square meter of the building the whole year how when how summer sorry the chiller electricity used is 4.4 kilowatt hour not very large but then the pumps consume almost similar then the the cold the produce cold water chilled water they produce cooling the cooling is only nine kilowatt hour per square meters then you take nine divided by the energy you got the cop is just 1.2 that's too small normally with this system we can do three or four that's the minimum but in this case only 1.2 why something like that because then we find that we made the measurement we find the mean open rate for the frontal unit is only seven percent means the people not always turn on the most of the time they switch off the fan to save energy when they're not in the room they switch off this is a chinese habitat so then but the water through goes through circulated so the pumps consume huge energy the temperature difference between inlet and outlet of the chilled water is very small less than one kelvin then we did some simulation we designed three models to use one is just what happened there the when the people turn on the frontal unit is dependent on the indoor temperature the mean value is 29 but it's the probability is a distribution and when the people turn off the frontal unit also dependent on the temperature also a probability distribution and then the set point is around 27 degrees c is one model not the model is as soon as you at home you turn on and when you leave in unoccupied you switch off that's not the case. Then the case three, the model three is whatever all the summer I always turn on, whatever I'm there or not. But also take the same point as okay, 24 degrees C. Then we make three cases. One is the most of the people is model A, another is the most of the people model B, and the summer A and C. And the third case is most of the people working like C. Then it seems a very interesting result is you can see the genius index for this very safe energy model. They are very large, means sometimes this room turn on, sometimes not room turn on as very uncentered. But for the model, the case three is means all the time most of people turn on so it's very uniform but the genius index is very small then for this three situation for the safety you can see the cop is low you know good the efficiency is low for the all the 
you use the all the time, the COP is not too bad for, but the unreused also very high. This blue bar is the all the time operation. This blue bar is part time, part space. And even when the temperature comes to 27, 28, people forgot to turn on, they still switch off. So then the red bar is when you use the split unit. Suppose the split unit, the COP is only three. And the, sorry, the, the blue one is a centralized system. The COP, the chiller COP is very high. But when the people all use in the same time during the whole summer operation, then the centralized system use less energy, high COP, okay, high COP, less energy. And the split unit, the decentralized, they need more energy. However, for the safe model, the decentralized less energy, the centralized need more. You can see, we cannot certainly say always something. It's very, very dependent on the real usage model. So then we have to balance between the efficiency and the real consumption. The centralized and decentralized, not the two offset state, but continual process. What we study is try to make the balance between the supply and the demand. So then the this question is we need high efficiency or the less energy use. The, the energy real use equal to the service demand divided by the efficiency. So high efficiency, you can use less energy. But for the service demand is include part. The effective demand means really useful and the non-effective demand means for you give the service to empty room, no people inside is just the waste. So we need a high efficiency and we need a less portion of this non-effective demand. A central system often costs over supply, so to make a large portion of non-effective demand. So if a high efficiency system leads to a large portion of the non-effective demand, then we, maybe we prefer the low efficiency with low portion of the non-effective demand, so to reduce low energy. That's the key point. Okay. Then people say the management and the cost we can find for the decentralized system device because they can much large, at a very large scale produce, so they can be very low cost compared with large equipment centralized system. And then for management, as soon as the IT technology are well developed, they can be made it possible to maintain the decentralized system device with very high level reliability. So the, this will be not the point. Then the space also, as soon as the little really decentralized, then by the end, you can save some space. So now we come to the conclusion. I think my time is run out. The building service is not a, the same with the industry process is not the same due to the uncentralized feature. And then the central system may use more energy. And uncentralized operation time, load, and the quality, all these kind of things need all supply with when you use the central system. Then the larger the number of the terminals, then the more uncentralized, then you got large Gini index, then the end is more energy use. So what we should do is to try to develop a decentralized system, improve the efficiency of the equipment, improve the operation with maybe AI technology, and improve the maintenance ability so that this maybe should be the direction of the future development. I think. Thank you very much. Hey, that's my talk. Ah, I can I can switch off. Thank okay. you so much. Thank oh. you so much, Yi, 
for your uh, really, really inspiring talk. And uh, right now, uh, if I could ask um, yeah. all the panelists to, um, um, to gather here, um, I think that this is time for uh, some discussion. Um, and uh, we have received a lot of questions from the audience. So oh. what we are going to do is that we are going to uh, select a few representative questions from the audience and uh, uh, for the panels to uh, share their own views. Uh, so uh, first of all, I think that maybe I will ask the, all our panelists to you know, uh, comment uh, say a few sentences or say a few things about, you know, maybe introducing yourself or, uh, you know, your thoughts after Professor Jiang Yi's talk. Right. Okay, so I'm just going to go first. Uh, <laughs> thoughts. Uh, first of all, very good talk. I mean, you know, a, a lot of things, uh, a lot of people have talked about distributed versus centralized. I just want to say that this is a much broader topic now because it's not only energy use, you also have very high global warming potential of the refrigerants being used in this air conditioning systems. So I think the question I have is that how much is the leakage of refrigerant coming from, let's say, let's do a hypothetical study. Everybody has a central distributed air conditioner versus buildings have centralized. How much extra global warming uh, refrigerant leakage will happen because you have so many of these now and 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 as we know that's one of the biggest challenges so it's not only about energy co2 from energy energy because maybe energy will become more decarbonized because of renewable penetration renewable energy so that is one thing that has to really take into consideration before people as a society we say or distributed is the best way to go okay that's one uh, second is how much it will be the embedded energy, right? If you imagine that you, you make, keep on making so many of distributed air conditioners, there's going to be impact of materials supply, as well as an amount of energy needed to make those distributed air conditioner or cooling devices. Okay. And, and, and finally, in context of significant penetration of renewable energy, again, you have to really balance between uh, which systems provide you more control and, and which systems provide you more demand response flexibility so these things have to be taken into consideration and from a very holistic point of view and saying which system and which architecture is better. I mean, those are my overall comments. Okay, thank you very much. Can I answer the question? Yang Yin, you are. So you, 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 you got a very important point about the leakage of the refrigerant. If you if you're talking about uh, say 10 or 20 years ago, the leakage really some big problem. That's why at that time I understand there is a, there is a special service that they take this refrigerant to go to every home to recharge that because there's a leakage problem. However, now after 20 years now, we did a lot of uh, Seville to see what happened now, we find because the quality is getting better, so most of the air conditioner, especially for residential buildings, the split in unit, even after 10 years, now any leak. After this since has been finished life, they still no need for recharge again. This for uh, split unit, the decentralized. However, if you go back to the large chillers on the big building, what happened, normally every year they have to do one time of the maintenance. If you well manage that, you can very good control to say don't make the leakage or take the refrigerant away uh, somewhere then you handle that. However, in some case, during the the maintenance, you just open the, the system and take this refrigerant away. So my, my point in this, I, I did some special study, take some students to do some real investigation, we find now, if you say the quality of the system now, the decentralized split unit may be deliver a leak less refrigerant compared with the big chillers. That's my point. Maybe someone have different option. That's the first. 
Second, they were talking about the manufacturer power size, the energy use, the I think of the large system and the small system, they are not very different because for the large system, maybe the chillers less, but you need piping system, you need data, you need all these things is also something. So in terms of the uh, banded energy, I don't think there can be big difference, but we need to do some more study to see that. And then the third question, if you say, if I heard correctly, is about the control. Can we solve this centralized system by good control? Yeah, a lot of people believe that, but I try, in fact, as young inside, I'm the control people, in fact, for many, many years, I try that very hard. Say 20 or 30 years ago, when I chose control, I think maybe by good control, we can solve this problem. But now I lose my evidence. I think maybe that's quite hard. Instead of only do the control itself, maybe you have to, to do something at the beginning for the system, make the system more suitable for the real demand. Then, <laughs> Is the total final solution? Thank you. I don't know the answer. Maybe you have it. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Satish. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll go. Um, I know that uh, I think we are uh, probably running a little late. Uh, I have uh, uh, again three points to make uh, uh, based on uh, uh, the excellent. Uh, uh, presentation that was made and I am uh, Satish Kumar. I am based in New Delhi. So I will bring in some perspectives from India uh, where uh, it is forecast that the biggest cooling demand uh, for the next 20, 30 years is going to emerge out of uh, India because of a uh, large population, very low penetration of air conditioner, both in residential building and in commercial building and people's desire uh, to own air conditioners as uh, uh, the middle class grows in India. So um, three things that I want to highlight and then I would uh, also talk about some other technologies that are not mainstream right now, uh, which are being tried uh, under the global cooling price. So the three questions are that, um, is there one temperature set point? Uh, uh, Professor, you talked about it, uh, that we should design it. And uh, uh, we know that ASHRAE has uh, uh, changed its uh, uh, comfort temperature definition. And what we are seeing is that the temperature set point that is uh, going to be preferred by people in Scandinavia is going to be very, very different from somebody in New Delhi. And that could be a difference of like six, seven degrees Celsius, about 10, 12 degree Fahrenheit. That can have a very, very significant impact. And what kind of systems, whether it's centralized systems, decentralized system, whether it's evaporative cooling, whether it's vapor compression, our technology system is going to be better geared for taking those uh, things into account. So that's my first question. Um, the second observation that I want to make, and this goes back to the point uh, uh, that Professor Yi made, is that you need to have controls where the latency in the system is fairly low. And by that, what I mean that you can change the temperature quickly, you can shut down the temperature, uh, shut down the system without having negative impacts on the system. And the reason I'm saying that this is really important in the Indian context is because in India, the amount of air conditioning demand that is come, going to come out from residential system is about 10x than what is going to come from commercial systems. And I think that is something that needs to be kept in mind as we think for the next generation solution. Uh, the third point that I just want to make is what about hybrid solutions? Right now, I think vapor compression technology is the way to go. But if we think about designing for passive uh, solar design, if we design very good building envelope, try to reduce cooling demand, expand the thermal comfort envelope based on adaptive thermal comfort standard, then evaporative cooling, whether it's direct evaporative cooling or indirect evaporative cooling can start to play a significant role. And this is what we have observed in the global cooling price 
uh, that Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, along with Department of Science and Technology, AEEE, SEPT University, and Conservation X Labs, is uh, launched to come out with the next generation of solutions where most of the big companies, including like GRE, Daikin, Godridge, from around the world, they are proposing uh, hybrid solutions so that when the humidity is low, they can run it as evaporative cooler. And when the humidity gets high, they can actually turn on the vapor compression systems. Uh, and of course, there are some solid state cooling uh, technology that has also come out. So I will stop here. I'm not expecting an answer, but I just wanted to put some of these things in context in terms of how India is looking to solve its cooling problem and what can be some of the technological fixes there. So, thank you very much. Maybe I also explain some of my ideas to answer your nice questions. First, about the setting temperature. What we believe, also different places, people, first, the different setting set point can make huge difference in real energy used. Secondly, what I believe is most of the people, they don't understand how, what the temperature is more comfortable. They are not a professional people, normal people, they do not. So then, even some people believe the set point is means what temperature of the supply air you need. That's why they take 16 degrees C rather than 20 something. And then what we finally, what we did for the centralized system, instead of asking the people to put your set point of the temperature, we just give the button, let people to comply. They felt too hot. You press this button, you feel too cold, you press another button. Then the system just learning according to the complaint number of complaint times. Then after the period of the day, few days, the complaint name, the number of the complaint getting smaller. The system can learn how much you really want. Never let you to ask the temperature. Just ask you to come back, come back. And then the, the, the target is try to reduce the number of come back. This may be worse. This is the first answer. And then for the evaporated cooling, I'm really support, fully support you. The evaporated cooling is a very important technique in the future to reduce the cooling energy and to save our the climate. And we just, uh, set up a big project, international collaboration under IEA, EBC, there is six countries, I believe, involved in this event, the cooling project. But what I would like to say here is, for the good event cooling system, not small, not small device, big one, they only should be for some large commercial buildings that they have to use a centralized system or big hotel, sorry, uh, shopping mall, this kind of thing. For residential, even the evaporated cooling system is very high efficiency, but because it's centralized, you need the transportation, you need all this kind of stuff. Then by the end, you can find only the pawns, the fans, even this energy can be higher than if you put in the in and decentralized the small small uh, split unit. The small split unit still safe that. It means just as what I mentioned, you have the high efficiency. So if I the cooling is high efficiency, but has to be centralized according to the feature. And then the decentralized the small split unit is relatively low efficiency, but because it's a small, easy to control. Then by then, the, if you combine these two solutions, you can find four residential buildings still split unit. The decentralized system may be better than the large evaporated cooling system. That's come from, from my practical situation. Some, some, Seville and something like that. But thank you for your mention the if I have the cooling technology, that's really very modern. Thank you. 
So. I can jump in for a second to uh, Dr. Zhang. Thank you for your great presentation and for challenging the status quo. I think when we think about buildings and, and we haven't seen as much innovation in buildings and about how to do things differently in the last few decades. And so it's really great to see that you're, you're providing some information to us to sort of challenge that how we're, we're thinking about buildings um, could be wrong in, in some cases. So I really appreciate that. Um, uh, I'm Alexis Abramson. I'm the Dean of Engineering at Dartmouth and I've been working in buildings for a while. Um, I, I wanna just make a few sort of comments. Um, one was with respect to your, your comments uh, at the end in response to Ravi uh, around the, uh, that idea around intelligence and controls. And, and I, I think, um, you know, to, it's a, in many cases, you, look at the, you wanna look at the individual case, you wanna look at the building um, and you wanna understand, could you maybe solve this better, this problem better with respect to putting a centralized system in and putting in some kind of intelligence and controls, right? I don't know, some cases it might be better to, to some of the data you showed too. Um, and I think it's important that we have the ability to do that analysis. And I'm not sure we do just yet and how we take advantage of data analytics and machine learning better. And I think that's a really emerging field and, and we'll see how that evolves. We need the participation of people on this, uh, participants on this webinar too, to, to see how that evolves. So I think that's, that's a, a really important piece of this. And I also wanted to mention on some things that were, were touched on, mentioned some things that were touched on too, and that, right, this is a complex picture. Uh, it depends on the, the country you're in, the economic structure of the country. It depends on climate. Certainly some climates are going to be better suited for a centralized uh, system, some more better suited for a decentralized system. Uh, are we talking about an urban solution or a rural, you know, uh, building? And so all of that matters as well. And then policy, what kind of policies exist in the countries that are looking at efficiencies and efficiency minimums and requirements around efficiency of HVAC? Uh, and, and that's highly variable too, and that could also influence this. Uh, also, what is the building's end use, right? Is it a coffee shop or is it an office building, right? And, you know, very different kinds of energy use patterns in those building types. Again, that could influence the best uh, solution here. And then I just wanted um, uh, to mention too, let's not forget building envelope, right? Because at the end of the day, the better the building envelope, uh, uh, the less energy is consumed in heating and cooling, certainly. And so, uh, so there's still a lot of innovation and market deployment of, of great building envelope solutions that need to be out there in the world so that we can further minimize uh, our HVAC usage. Okay, thank you very much for your point. But firstly, when you're talking about control, what means control? Uh, can I, if I don't mind, can we, we are running out of time. Can we give it to the audience? We have only 10 minutes left. Okay, sure, sure. So if Great. you don't mind, Yang Yang, this is okay. really important that the audience get a chance to ask the question to the panelists. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ravi, and thank you, uh, Yi, for the wonderful discussions. So uh, given that we only have 10 more minutes left, so I uh, will... Uh, based on popularity, I picked two questions. Um, so the first question uh, is coming from uh, Professor Leon Glixman um, cool. at MIT. And mm -hmm. his question is on um, how about what's the role of natural ventilation uh, and uh, in, uh, so, uh, in the AC energy consumption? And uh, another question, similar question also coming from uh, Am Amr Roth, also on natural uh, ventilation and their influence on uh, central and decentralized uh, air conditioning systems. Uh, can I answer this question? Thank you, Liam. He's my old friend many, many years. And the natural ventilation is the first priority, I always believe, very, very important. Open windows, open windows to let the go, air go through. Whatever central air conditioning or decentralized, the natural ventilation is very important in many, many cases. And, uh, but then sometimes the natural ventilation doesn't work with the mechanic system. So then if for centralized things, if I need natural ventilation, I just switch off the 
my canning one and I got my windows, I got naturalization. But for the central air conditioning system, the manager of that always say, okay, never open the windows. You already been well conditioned your space. You cannot interrupt the my system. You see. So from the point of the encourage the natural ventilation, then the decentralized system may be the priority. That's my point. Thank you. Yang Ying, maybe I will just uh, respond to that question as well. Uh, so I think one of the fundamental things that need to be looked at uh, when we are trying to incorporate natural ventilation strategy is uh, whether the building is going to be air conditioned or the building is going to be running in a hybrid mode. Part of the time it is going to run just on natural ventilation. Part of the time it is going to run on air conditioning system or I think the building is only running on natural ventilation. And the strategies, I think, as Alexis also mentioned, that the building envelope, the way you design that, and that means that what is your insulation, what is your shading strategy, what is your natural ventilation strategy, what kind of bioclimatic uh, designs that you design around your building becomes very, very important. So in my opinion, I want to use this lean, mean, and green construct Lean is like you design the building so that you minimize the load that is coming on the building. And that's, I think, can be done through natural ventilation big time. Mean is when you go for the most energy efficient system to meet the load. And green is like when you use renewable energy or when you use natural or green refrigerants to start to meet your cooling demand. So I think that's how I see natural ventilation playing into, I think, how should you have an integrated building design approach. Thank you. Thank you, uh, E and uh, Satish. Um, and uh, I think that uh, given that we have uh, last uh, five minutes, I'd like to read question two, uh, which uh, we received. Uh, uh, a few of the questions are based on the same, same theme. It's on the current situation on COVID-19. So the question is, um, given the uh, situation about COVID-19, how should we design air conditioning and ventilations to uh, uh, mitigate the transmission? Okay. Maybe I think I will uh, just uh, very quickly intervene here. Uh, I know that ASHRAE uh, has um, uh, a pretty big uh, focus right now on um, uh, designing buildings, I think, and running the HVAC system in a COVID-19 situation. So uh, there will be, I think, a lot of very useful and detailed uh, material that is there. One of the things that we are seeing uh, in India is that a lot of people, in order to save energy, are doing recycling of uh, ventilation. And I think that's one thing that should be a clear no-no in a COVID-19 type situation, because the more recycled air that you are going to use, the chances of, I think, airborne transmission is going to increase. Uh, but clearly, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty big topic. There is a lot of, I think, good materials uh, that is out there by ASHRAE and other organizations uh, that people can look, uh, look up to. Thank you. One thing maybe I would like to mention the that even for, of course, uh, nitro ventilation is very good uh, for against this kind of works. However, even for the circulated air, as soon as you have the filter, not very high efficiency, say uh, 60% or 70% of the efficiency filter, like the middle level, level F, I think this is in the United States also have this kind of level, normal filter. You put this, then they can take half of the particles that support this have some words on that. Then you can reduce the, 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 the particles in the room that with the virus. Because the air, first, the outdoor air is clearly no problem. Secondly, as soon as you take the filter to collect, collect some virus uh, particles, then the, in the space you conditioned, the virus is getting smaller. So then the major important thing, very important thing, is a large amount of air, whatever circulated, all come from outdoor, come from windows. 
the large amount of air is most important. According to our study recently, we learned, suppose there is one people, senior people that do have this virus, then and other people want to stay in the same space for say four hours, then you need something like 3,000 cubic meters air per hour. They can make the, 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 the dangerous the probability to be infected down to less than 1%, something like that. They can radically analyze this of that. So large amount of wind is very important. The affected wind equal to the, the real circulation air volume multiplied by the efficiency. If the filter, if the filter is say sixty percent, means the circulated air multiplied by the sixty percent, the result equal to the natural ventilation cause the same amount of air come from outdoor. It's the same functions in in this case is the same functions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, E again. Thank you for all the panelists. Uh, I think that it, it is probably time for we to conclude, even though we can uh, we do not have more time to answer every questions of the audience, but we will uh, we have all the Q and A and we will try to respond them uh, after the this session. So now I would like to uh, share my screen again uh, because we have two more uh, quizzes, uh, two more Paul uh, pool questions for you guys at the end of this uh, session, and so I'm going to launch uh, uh, last two questions. And so question number three, uh, if you can see it popping up on your screen is, uh, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, this, uh, yes. So question number three is, uh, what in your opinion should be the focus of research and development community to sustainably cool people without warming the planet? So the, the first choice is cool the people, not buildings. And the second is develop the ideal refrigerant molecules. And the third is that we design a non-vapor compression based cooling system with significantly less climate impact. And the last one is design an AI driven on demand HVAC control system. So we, uh, so I'm gonna leave it open for a few more seconds um, and then uh, show you the result. <laughs> so, so I am going to, uh, no, I'm going to end the poll right now. And uh, if you can see the result, uh, you will see that uh, we have a pretty, uh, pretty, uh, <laughs> uh, we have a lot of different opinions, right? So uh, a lot of people voted for, uh, you know, local cooling cool the people. And uh, uh, some of you also voted uh, design a non-vapor compression based cooling system. Uh, in also in addition to AI driven. So it seems like we have a lot of uh, focus of the future research, which is great. Um, so the second, uh, the second, the last uh, pool would be that uh, in what is, in your opinion, what is the most important area for uh, research and development innovation in designing next generation thermal comfort solutions? And so we also have a few choices. And I would like to mention that this is really uh, to an opportunity to gain your feedback. So uh, if you would like to offer any answer that's not listed here, please feel free to uh, type them in the Q&A. And so, so the choices we offered here are hybrid design to meet latent and sensible cooling load. Um, and uh, obviously it's really important because we have to control temperature and also humidity. The second so, choice is that enhance the efficiency of heat exchangers uh, in addition to radiate cooling system and phase change materials for the thermal storage. So uh, feel free to please type in your, uh, your own understanding, your own thoughts in the Q&A session. So I am going to, uh, we have a lot of response, so I'm going to show you the result. 
Uh, so uh, about half of the audience uh, voted for uh, a hybrid design to meet the latent and sensible cooling load. Uh, so this is our uh, all we wanted to discuss and wanted to uh, bring bring in some discussion within the community. So I'm going to uh, stop sharing, and I would like to quickly just mention that feel free to uh, submit any comment to the Q and A. And uh, before we conclude today's session. I would like to thank our speaker again and thank all the panelists. Uh, and uh, it's really inspiring uh, discussion and re really inspiring talk and a lot of great in, uh, discussions. Um, our, our next uh, uh, lecture would be offered by Professor Ken Goodson from Stanford University. So uh, his talk will be uh, not next week, but on, on June 3rd. Uh, and his topic will be uh, getting the heat out, electronics cooling from smartphones to data centers. So more on the thermal management of electronic. So if you, uh, we welcome to still participate in our next colloquium. And so uh, with that, we will probably- So I, I just want to take a chance to also thank Yang Yang for doing yes. a great job in moderating the session. Uh, so it's, a, uh, and, and so thank you, thank you Yang Ying for, you know, uh, nicely navigating through all the tools in the Zoom and nicely doing the, the polling. Uh, so again, thanks on behalf of the panel, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, uh, you know, Professor Prasher for sharing your opinions. Uh, and thank you all the panelists and, and thank you all the audience uh, for your questions. And uh, really thank uh, Professor Gong Chen and all the student helpers for organizing this event. And uh, we hope to uh, see you in next uh, uh, lecture. And uh, I think that the, we will uh, leave the uh, webinar open for a few more minutes for you to type in your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.